Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be watching from. I'm Jay Levinson, the director of MoMA's International Program, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first panel in this year's CMAP seminar series, Transversal Orientations. CMAP, which stands for Contemporary and Modern Art Perspectives, is a research initiative started at MoMA in 2009 that promotes the in-depth study of art histories outside North America and Western Europe. It is currently made up of four groups composed of over 60 staff members from 16 of the museum's departments that focus on modern and contemporary art in Africa, Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, and Latin America. Each group is led by one or more senior MoMA curators who are assisted by graduate or postgraduate fellows. The curators now are Sean Anderson, Stuart Comer, Inez Katzenstein, Smooth Nazewi, and Roxana Markoch. The fellows are Nancy Dantas, Inga Lasse, Madeline Turner, and Wang Minghao. The CMAP coordinator is Nene Jalo. The groups invite scholars, artists, and curators to lead monthly workshops on their specialties at the museum although this year these are being conducted virtually, and to organize annual research groups trips to obtain firsthand knowledge of the areas they are studying. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the two principal sponsors of the program, MoMA's International Council and Agnes Gund. The CMAP fellows edit our online publication, Post, Notes on Modern and Contemporary Art Around the Globe, which is the public face of the research program. They also organize from time to time collaborative seminars among all four groups, helping members to think more deeply about how the museum might best address a, a global view of art. The topics of past seminars have included performativity, transnational histories and non-aligned networks, multiple modernities, international networks, global collecting practices and challenges of museum display. The seminar for 2021 is entitled Transversal Orientations and will focus on the concept of the transversal as a means of engaging with and envisioning new networks and ways of thinking about modern and contemporary art. The seminar will take place across four sessions, today and tomorrow and next Wednesday and Thursday. I'd now like to pass the microphone to Smooth Nzewi MoMA's Stephen and Lisa Tannenbaum, Curator of Painting and Sculpture and leader of CMAP's Africa Research Group, who will introduce the first of this year's seminar sessions. Please welcome Smooth. Thank you, Jay. Uh, and hello, everyone. So I'm so excited to be uh, participating in my first CMAP uh, uh, conference. Uh, this year's symposium titled uh, Transversal Orientations is particularly pertinent as the world recovers from a global pandemic and continues to grapple uh, with the anti-Black racism reckoning in the aftermath of the murder of um, George Floyd last year. One of the things the events of uh, last year uh, brought to our attention, aside from the, ma the mass uh, hysteria it easily mobilized, is a realization of how the global hierarchy of power uh, conditions our responses. So in the case of George uh, Floyd, location matters. His death in the United States, uh, the world's sole superpower, activated an unprecedented uh, global outcry. Now, the subtext of this scenario, I imagine, is the fulcrum of today's panel's key question. How can minor positions weave a fabric of their own links uh, their own links directly by passing the centers of power and information. This question led me to, to Floyd, perhaps not in the way this panel might have um, imagined a response. So here is a minority in America whose blackness became a global rallying cry against institutional uh, oppression and, and racism, notwithstanding the power inherent in the location of his death. But without trivializing Floyd's unfortunate passing, um, it also offers um, a compelling metaphor for me in thinking about the global contemporary. Uh, this um, idea that we live in a coeval world and, and share access um, to information, or that artists who operate in the international terrain of the art world speak a language of artistic contemporaneity 
uh, accessible to, to multiple audiences. Yet what is understated is the pecking order of temporalities, the unequal conditions of history, and the social and economic forces uh, that play a role in either privi uh, privileging or suppressing artistic narratives and in shaping the reception of art. This is precisely uh, the contextual space of today's panel, looking sideways, and from which the three panelists stage the transversal from varying perspectives that expand uh, the policed uh, borders of art history. And so Sorowitz's uh, song satire explores Maori uh, knowledge systems to, to offer fresh insights on ecology and subjectivity. Uh, Corinna Apostol recuperates the historical Emily Sal and the colonial memory associated with her botanical interests in Indochina. And Ruth Zimbao reflects on two iconic portraits that make space for considering Afro-Asian solidarities. And so solidarity, resistance, and decolonization are ideological bulwarks that draw upon histories and legacies of colonialism, oppression, and racism. But it's always interesting uh, to me when such ideas are considered in the context of traditional uh, centers of power. And so I end uh, on this note with a self-reflexive question that I hope we all keep in mind during this symposium. How might uh, the transversal be further imagined to account for regimes of knowledge that retain old patterns or structures of power? I say this uh, bearing in mind that although this is a virtual symposium, it is against the backdrop of a traditional uh, center of power. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Smooth. Hi, everyone. My name is Wang Bing Hao, and I'm the CMAP Asia Fellow, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I'd just like to quickly run through the proceedings for today's panel. The panel will run for two hours from 9 to 11 a.m. EST. Our three invited speakers, Sorowit, Karina, and Ruth, will share and introduce their work for about 20 minutes each after which we will open up to the proverbial floor for questions and discussion. For this purpose, please be reminded that the chat function is operational throughout the meeting. So please type your questions in at any point during the seminar and we will read them carefully and do our best to respond to all of them during the discussion. I'd also like to take this opportunity to communicate a note of thanks on behalf of all the fellows and the CMAP team, thank you first and foremost to all the speakers who are participating in this year's seminar, who are joining us from all around the world and from many different time zones. We sincerely appreciate the effort that you've put in to prepare for this seminar and we have thoroughly enjoyed the conversations with you in the lead up to this event. Um, we really eagerly anticipate the coming panels and more conversations to come. Thank you as well to my colleagues in the International Program Department at MoMA, Nene Giallo, Marta Danzi, Jay Levinson, um, all the CMAP group leaders and group members, especially Sean Anderson and Stuart Comer, um, who I work with and who are co-leads of the Asia Group for their guidance and encouragement. Thank you, Sarah Lukowski, as well as the fellows, my colleagues, um, Nancy Dantas, Inga Lassa, and Madeline Murphy-Turner. Finally, a personal note of thanks to all the friends and interlocutors from Southeast Asia and its diasporas whose conversation and insight have left such an indelible impact on our program. I hope to welcome you all virtually throughout the seminar um, events. So now we will move on to the first speaker for today's panel. Sorawit Songsataya is a Thai-born artist who lives and works in Te Wanganui Atara, Wellington. Their practice explores the many tangents that connect and redefine our understandings of subjectivity and ecology. Song Sataya often employs moving image and sculpture within installation environments, incorporating both digital and tactile media to engage with world making in imaginative and tangible ways. They are the winner of the 2020 Molly Marpeth Kennedy Award 3D 
and the 2016 National Contemporary Art Award. Song Sataya has held artist residencies with Enjoy Contemporary Art Space in Wellington, McKeon House, Auckland, and the International Artist Studio Program in Stockholm. Recent exhibitions include Come Up For Air at the Lightship, Rumors Mermaid at the Govert Brewster Art Gallery, The Interior at the Auckland Art Gallery, Jupiter at the Te Uru Waitakere Contemporary Gallery, Starling at Art Space Aratera, and soon enough, Art in Action at Tensta Kunsthal, Stockholm. Please join me in welcoming Sorowit Sangsataya. Hi, um, kia ora. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, it's good night for me. It's 1 a.m. here in New Zealand. Um, but thanks for having me. Um, so today I'm just going to be talking about three works. Um, let me just share my slide with you. Um, yep, so you can all see my slide. Um, so yeah, as being just introduced me, um, my name is Sarawit. And I am an artist um, currently based in Te Wanganui Atara, Wellington, um, here in New Zealand. Um, I often make installations that um, comprise sculptures, ceramics, um, textiles, and um, 3D animations. And I would say that through my installations, um, I explore um, intricate links and the dynamic relationships that we have with the natural world. Um, at times, um, the thinking behind my works are um, formed by Thai belief systems and Te Ao Māori, which is um, the worldview of Indigenous Māori people here in New Zealand. Um, so I would try to describe how I navigate and position myself um, through my work um, as, a, as a Thai born person um, living and creating artworks in a bicultural nation. Um, and I use the word bicultural here because um, New Zealand was found on a legal document that signed between Maori and the British Crown called um, the Treaty of Waitangi. And this legal document um, to a certain degree, um, as I immigrated to New Zealand, it binds me as a byproduct of the British colonial project. And this has complicated my position in many ways as Thailand has never been colonized, though we have been westernized. Um, I had to learn to understand colonial history um, specific to New Zealand context and learn to be held accountable as a Toiwi, which means a foreigner to Indigenous people here. So in my recent works, um, I'm beginning to learn more and more about cultural protocols and sensitivity in regards to how I approach natural materials that belong to this land. Um, in this work, um, the, the and the current image that you're seeing now, um, I title it Seaside Town. Um, this work was the first time that I learned to ask for a permission from a local iwi, um, which means tribe, um, representative um, of, of tribal um, people from the region, um, asking them for a permission to work with um, this natural limestone. And I did this to make sure that the stones weren't quarried from an old settlement area and to also learn through the process that um, not everything is there for me to take. Um, so Seaside Town is um, a series of five hand carved limestone sculptures with um, beeswax, shells, pebbles, dry plants, um, some synthetic eyelashes and nails. Um, and they are about knee height um, and they're quite heavy approximately. Um, the big ones it's, is around 140 kg. Um, 
and to practically carving the stone, oh, sorry, physically carving the stone myself, um, I learned about its weight, its temperature, and um, the mineral composite that formed the material. So limestones are sedimentary rocks that compose of um, calcium carbonate that often comes from plant and um, animal skeletons, um, mostly of tiny sea organisms, um, shells and corals um, over millions of years and it form underneath the sea. Um, and because of this skeletal composite, I started to think of the material as um, a body of bones um, and try to consider its um, genealogy, um, its transition, transformation and history. Thinking of how the sea rising up from, you, you know, the material rising up from the sea floor and now it is a massive farmland in um, northern Otago near Omaru, um, which is the city, which is the city where um, the stone got its name from. So in New Zealand, this type of limestone is quite well known. Um, it's called Omaru limestone. Um, so calling by titling the work Seaside Town, um, I also kind of try to link the material, the stone back to its original geographic location. Um, but also a seaside town in Thailand too was a place where my father was born and a vague memory of us and our family kind of during um, this Loi Gratong festival, um, lighting up these small terracotta lamps filled with beeswax um, around our house veranda. Um, oops. But to think of seaside towns in the title, I also think of, um, quite practically or literally beaches and shorelines um, where liquid sea meets concrete land and the transitory places in between that neither land nor sea. And this transitory place is what I often think of as a third place, um, not only within the context of biculturalism in New Zealand, but also from the perspectives of queer and diasporic experiences. Um, and I will, talk more on this third place um, in the following work. So this work is called Jupiter and it was a six channels video installation um, with eight suspended craft objects resembling Thai kite design. And this is the installation shot and the three monitors that you can see on the floor um, contain a collection of footage that I shot at a wind farm in Wellington, um, collection of neon light structures at a night market in Thailand and some traveling clips from overseas places. And there are the other three um, monitors, hanging monitors. Um, they contain a mix of footage that I um, shot at a Thai kite festival and um, some of my 3D animation of kites. And I was first drawn to kites because of, um, um, it was actually quite coincident and a coincident because I saw a, a Matariki ad on, on Facebook and Matariki is um, a new year for Maori. And um, in this online advertisement, it has a slogan that say, um, kites reconnect heaven and earth. And the word reconnect is um, quite important in this context because there was a separation. So in Maori our oral tradition, there was a story that the earth mother, the land was pushed apart from the sky father um, by one of their children, Tane. And um, with, with this story, um, natural phenomena such as rainfall and Morning dews are often seen as acts of mourning um, from the sky father of this separation um, from the, the earth mother. And one of the kites role in this oral tradition is to reconnect um, this separation. Um, and in many parts of Southeast Asia as well, um, kites have this kind of intermediary role. Um, 
during my research, I found that in Sulawesi Island of Indonesia, um, the kite also has this, it, it acts as a mediator, um, sending messages from humans to the invisible God. Um, and the kite in this way becomes um, a kind of an agent that attempts to intervene and communicate it between worlds. Um, and in Thailand also, kites have an agricultural role, signaling the arrival of the northern of the northeastern wind, which um, indicates the time for rice harvesting. Um, kite flying is also registered as a national sport in Thailand and um, fierce competitions and betting between um, Jula, which is a male kite, and Pak Pao, a female kite, were established and popularized by kings um, during the Ayutthaya period, which was, about, which was around um, the 1350s to 1767. So the concept of gender associated with Thai kite um, competition also emerged during this period as well. And um, why Pak Bao, the female kite, affiliates with the female, <laughs> the competition itself and the craftsmanship were actually reserved almost exclusively to male at the time. Um, however, during my 2018 visit um, back home, um, back to Thailand to learn the craft of kite making. Um, my teacher was one of the only two women in the village who can make and fly kites. Um, and from speaking with her and her friends, she and her friend are still being perceived as um, tomboy because of their craft and skills are operated within this male dominated field. Um, and I found that this gender binary in the context of Thai kite flying culture, um, in my view, kind of restricted the goal between position or the intermediary role that the kite object could otherwise um, represent. And I also try to thinking back to Maori oral tradition of the sky father and the earth mother and how the kite object in this oral tradition too um, operates between these male and female dominions. Um, and to bring back to the metaphor of the shorelines and the seaside town that I mentioned earlier in, in previous work with the limestone, this kind of transitory place um, makes often makes me think um, as I position myself within this biculturalism, um, I think of it as a third place um, which kind of represent the unlocatability um, of my experience or the body. Um, it was something that was at the forefront of my mind when I was making um, this kite project, um, locating and relocating back and forth between Thailand and New Zealand and where I stand in regards to um, my place um, and yeah, my gender identity. Um, so the project was also um, focused on the animating force of the wind um, as well. And um, I employed 3D computer animation um, in this work um, to mimic the, the movement of the wind velocity against the kite's body. Um, and it's interesting within this project to think of 3D animation um, to its terminology, um, its Latin root of the word anima, and how some of you might know that anima mean, meaning soul, but it also means wind, air, and breath. Um, and I found this double meaning of air and soul very interesting. Um, and to think of the air as an element um, that is bodiless and borderless. Um, so this is the stills of the animation. I, it's a shame I can't show you the actual footage because the hard drive is not with me at the moment. Um, so some more stills from the work of um, the kite exhibitions. 
So I, I use 3D animation quite a lot in my work, um, more so in the past. Um, and these last few slides are um, from um, a really old work <laughs> called um, Bronies from 2016. And at the time I was kind of exploring the relationship between 3D modeling and 3D printing um, quite a bit um, and was interested in how these technologies may reveal less and less of who the makers of the object and images might be. Um, and considering this in conjunction with my interest in tactile handmade objects and artisanship. Um, and the aspect that I enjoy working with this medium the most is um, its bodilessness, um, the, the 3D animation. Um, and the process can be quite liberating um, working with 3D animation to don't have to worry about the body or the physicality and rules of physics. Um, and I also see kind of potentials in cartoons and animation and fiction in this way as a desire or as a desire to reimagine um, beyond bodily limitations. Um, the 3D prints too, as a kind of um, um, a mater materialization of perhaps experiences that um, I find difficult to locate, um, articulate or translate. Um, it was satisfying at the time to kind of hold these printed objects in my hands and felt like these um, incommunicable experience were allowed to have forms and weight and to exist. So um, I thank you all for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Sarawit, for introducing what I know is really just a glimpse of, you know, a very complex practice and a lot of complex engagements um, in your work. And thank you so much for staying so late with us today. Um, and I'm really sure that we will definitely get into more about your practice later on. Um, so I, our next speaker is Karina L. Apostle. Karina is a curator at the Tallinn Art Hall in Estonia and the curator of the Estonian Pavilion at the forthcoming 59th Venice Biennale. She is a curator and member of the steering committee of Beyond Matter, an international collaborative practice-based research project that takes culture to the verge of virtual reality. Recently, she curated the second edition of the Shelter Festival, Cosmopolitics, Comradeship and the Commons at the Space for Free Arts at the University of the Arts, Helsinki, Finland. Previously, she was the Andrew W. Mellon Fellow at Creative Time, where she co-edited Making Another World Possible, 10 Creative Time Summits, 10 Global Issues, 100 Art Projects published by Rutledge in 2019. At Creative Time, she also co-curated the 12th Creative Time Summit on Archipelagos and Other Imaginaries 2018, which was a convening for thinkers, dreamers, and doers working at the intersection of art and politics across Miami. Karina obtained her PhD at Rutgers University, where she was also the Dodge Curatorial Fellow at the Zimmerli Art Museum from 2010 to 2016. She is the co-founder of the activist art and publishing collective Art Leaks and editor-in-chief of the Art Leaks Gazette. She has been long listed for the Kandinsky Prize in 2016 and the Sergei Kurokin Prize in 2020. So please join me in welcoming Karina. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Bing, for the introduction. And um, I just want to take a moment to thank the entire CMAP team for um, this wonderful opportunity for putting together these 
seminars and for bringing us all um, in conversation. Okay, so I will begin my presentation now and I hope everybody's able to see my slides. Okay, a flowering orchid is a sensation. There is something fairy tale like about the term orchid. Awesome characteristics are attributed to the flower. The positive aspect of these um, is that uh, orchids have become desirable. When an orchid flowers, it is discussed in newspapers. These words written over a century ago belong to the Estonian writer, photographer, and topographer Andres Sal, who together with his partner, Emily Sal, lived and worked on the island of Java, then part of the Dutch East Indies, today's Indonesia. Nowadays, orchid have become so commonplace while they cultivated and collected that it requires a stretch of the imagination to fathom the orchid delirium or orchid fever that gripped Europe at the time. Demand for these exotic plants emboldened orchid hunters who hounded new specimens to feed the European market. Orchids sold like jewels. By the early 20th century, orchid picking and uh, sales swelled so much so that they faced extinction in parts of Indonesia. Behind the beauty of tropical orchids lies a more complex and darker story of colonial ecological exploitation with repercussions to the present day. It is also significant that the movement of these plants around the world went hand in hand with the transportation of enslaved peoples on ships that crossed oceans. A colonial botanical artist hailing from a colonized land who traveled internationally, Emily Saul is a central character in the threads of entangled histories of national self-determination, colonialism, science, art, and botany. She was born in Tartu, Estonia, then part of the Russian Empire, studied art in St. Petersburg, then joined Andres Sal in Java between 1899 and 1920. They first lived in Surabaya, where Andres worked as the manager of the photography department at the Air Fury and Co. printing house. In 1902, they moved to Jakarta, which was then called Batavia, where Andres managed the photography department at the Topography Bureau in the service of the Dutch colonial army. In some ways, Emily's story is similar to that of other European women who pursued botanical art as an occupation and pastime. In the mid 19th century, Baltic German women painted flowers and plants, which sometimes became inspiration for patterns used in weaving. Women artists were only allowed to concentrate on portraits, still lives, landscapes, which created the idea of a so-called woman art in society considered less important. While women played a significant role in plant science through botanical art, many have not re received the recognition for their work as compared to their male counterparts. Uh, case in point, but Emily's botanical art and documents related to her life and work were rejected by the Estonian Literature Museum, which accepted all archival material related to her husband, Andres, from letters to photographs, essays, postcards, travel logs. In piecing her life story together, one has to read between the lines. Her work is particularly significant because unlike many of her counterparts, she was able to pursue art by traveling to Indonesia. More interestingly, as Estonia was then part of the Russian empire, her story is that of a colonized subject passing as a white colonizer in a foreign land. She arranged exhibitions to study tropical plants while becoming proficient in drawing the fine details of local plants at the Buitenzorg Botanical Gardens. She also collected specimens for an herbarium. These species uh, that you see now in the, this slide demonstrate her interest in the many parts of a plant and often include them to help readers identify specimens in different stages of bloom. Dutch trade and contact, conquest in Indonesia involved both new research with profiting from trade in these rare and exotic plants and other medicinals, as well as animals and seeds. The Dutch East India Company played a vital role in the advancement of cartography and also commissioned botanists and artists to record the natural history of local lands they had conquested. As the wife of a prominent official, Emily had unparalleled access to botanical gardens, sites across the archipelago, and the privilege of mobility through colonized landscapes. Moreover, at least a dozen Indonesian servants were employed in the Sal household, enabling her to pursue her work as an artist. Together with Andres, Emily worked on the manuscript called The Most Important and Interesting Examples of the Javan Flora in Color Drawings from Nature, which they intended to publish in Europe. 
the appetite for collecting these specimens and the concomitant study of natural history became integral to the production of art and culture, the emergence of new philosophies, and also the development of medicine and sciences in Europe. Botanical gardens played a key role in the trade and scientific study of nature. In the 19th century, most Estonians worked for Baltic German nobility in manors. For example, Radi Manor House in Tartu was owned by a noble Baltic German Baron Reinhold Karl von Liebhardt, who left his job as a military official and fully dedicated himself to gardening and breeding of orchids. He donated tropical plants from the greenhouse to the botanical garden in Tartu, and in 1858, a new greenhouse was built especially for orchids, which provided an opportunity to enlarge the Tartu collection. In Indonesia, Founded in 1817 by order of the government of the Dutch East Indies, the Herbarium and Museum for Systematic Botany at Wittenzorg was built over a sacred forest created to protect seeds of rare trees during the Sunda Kingdom in the 15th century. Besides a purely botanical and aesthetic function, this garden also had a commercial purpose. Tests were made with the cultivation of countless varieties of various crops. Uh, successful plant clones were then sent in substantial quantities to companies both locally and abroad. Emily had unparalleled access to the Buitens or gardens and had the privilege of bringing specimens home to study and paint. Specially crafted Wardian cases made by local Indonesian workers were used to send plants from these gardens. This case was invented by Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, an East London doctor and amateur horticulturalist. In the cell manuscript, Anders describes how in the beginning orchids were transported in damp conditions which caused them to wither, while later more appropriate inventions allowed collectors to import them. Wardian cases protected orchids and other tropical plants during transport, facilitating their trade worldwide. By allowing the, the transport of goods like orchids, flowers, crops, like rubber, sugar, and coffee, and others, this invention helped shape uh, global tastes and modern economies and helped the reach of the European colonialism. So what makes Emily's life and artistic legacy so interesting? Her story twists the traditional colonialist narrative as she went from a colonized Estonian to a colonizer under Dutch employment. Her collection of orchids and tropical plants was part of a shared European colonial visual tradition and she became an emancipated woman at the expense of other colonized women. In the Saul household, different ethnicities and races, such as Dutch, Indonesian, Eurasian, classes and genders all intersected along the social patterns of the colonial divide. Indigenous women, which are left invisible in these images of lavish interiors, were part of the self-definition of white European women and also of white colonial society. In his writings, Andres explained that he actually wanted people from his native Estonia and Indonesia to become closer. He often wrote articles about culture and history of Indonesia to in Estonian newspapers. He also collected so-called oriental alphabets and sent it to Estonian linguists. He was interested in folk music in this country and published in the Indonesian press. Paradoxically, Andres was critical of the problems of Dutch colonial power in which he played a key role. His novels, White Oath and White Morning, dramatized consequences of the conquest of Java. Interestingly, these novels were published uh, later than when he wrote them due to their anti-imperial messages at a time when the Russian revolution was in full focus in Europe. Nonetheless, in part motivated by a better position and being supportive of his wife's botanical endeavors, he accepted the employ of the Dutch army. As a high ranking official, he fully adopted a Dutch way of life. This also included owning a rubber plantation on Java. Conventional history of botany and science during this period all but erased and ignored the role of indigenous uh, people. Silent by the nature of their work and the subordinated social class, these indigenous servants were not allowed to speak for themselves and were also rendered docile in visual imagery of the time. However, resistance to Dutch rule and exploitation did take root. The Samanist movement started in the last decade of the 19th century in the Kendeng mountain complex of Java, a region that the Sauls traveled to in their explorations. 
Srontik or Samin uh, from a teak forest village headed the movement. The Dutch government would force farmers to pay taxes on their land and also re restricted villagers access to forests by enacting the forest law of Java. Uh, the Saminist movement questioned the state ownership of the forest. And by 1907, over 3000 families started following these um, resistance principles. Some of those who resisted protesting by lying down on their land when the Dutch came to survey it. Others refused to pay taxes or fines or to perform free labor. Even after independence, the Indonesian run state reflected these Dutch roots and opposed this traditional agrarian lifestyle. And these choices have contributed to severe environmental degradation. The Sals would eventually retire to Los Angeles, California in 1921, and they, uh, and they settled uh, in Hollywood Heights next to what is today the Hollywood Walk of Fame. At the time, the US was going through an orchid delirium of its own. At, a, at official engagements, the first lady, Edith Wilson, would be seen wearing an over-the-top orchid corsage of fly flower embellishment that even the most distant audience members could see. During their courtship, President Wilson would give her fresh Cattleya orchid corsage every day. In the press, the orchid was hailed as the official flower of the White House. Perhaps not unsurprisingly then, in 1926, Emily's merits were recognized in her new country. She had an exhibition of all of her 333 works of plants, flowers, and fruit at the Exposition Park of Los Angeles, Museum of Science and Art. She received even a glowing review in the LA Times, including a special mention of her 100 paintings of rare orchids. And I quote, a work of over 20 years, a labor of love and beauty with a scientific interest, end quote. The show was open for two years from 1926 to 1928. And her collection was evaluated at over $15,000, uh, which was a very substantial amount at the time. While Stahl found a claim during her lifetime, many other botanical artists who were women went without such recognition. Her postcards are one of the few pieces of writing we have penned by the artist during her lifetime as the Estonian Literature Museum only collected um, material that shed light on Andres's achievements and not hers. As far as I've been able to research, Emily herself failed to recognize the connection between orchid hunting and environmental destruction in South Asia and her own involvement in this process. Estonia's own colonial ambitions manifested during the interwar period when it has just been established as a nation state. In 1933, Johannes Maide published in Valis Esti an article on Estonian colonial policy calling to buy small islands from Spain. Some diplomats supported this idea of an Estonian colony, and in 1936, the characteristics of each of these islands that could be colonized were discussed in the press. Meanwhile, international colonial exhibitions supported Dutch political, economic, and cultural programs. The architecture of these pavilions, which you see in this image, the sites and displays had an experimental quality, offering visitors means to interact and understand the relationship between modernity and colonial power. Over a decade later, the Indonesian War of Independence, which lasted from 1945 to 1949, um, um, was successful and Indonesia uh, proclaimed its independence in August 1945 after being colonized by the Dutch forces for over 350 years and later by Japan for three and a half years. The very space in which Saul, Emily Saul worked was enabled by Dutch sovereignty over the Dutch East Indies and thus her art was of course implicated in the colonial expansion itself. As viewer, we are, viewers, we are also implicated in these problems of exclusion and inclusion that the visible and invisible empire represented in these works poses. Fueled by such lavish illustrations produced by artists and sought by collectors, trees were felled to reach orchids um, growing on their branches and then paths were cleared through rainforests for easier transportation. Other more common plants were cast aside in search of more exotic species. Orchid delirium images whetted colonial appetites for what these forests held while being dependent on the exploitation of indigenous labor. 
The Tropen Museum, an ethnographic museum in Amsterdam, which organized this exhibition, Orchids, in 1971, still holds a vast collection of colonial era artifacts and images. And recently, the Dutch Council for Culture declared that museums should return art artifacts which were stolen during the colonial era to their countries of uh, origin. To give more dimension to this research that I've been able to collate uh, in um, uh, in Estonia, in the Netherlands, and in the US, and to include the perspective of those who are not represented and whose voices were not included in the colonial archives available to us here, I have sought to bring into conversation uh, also specialists from Indonesia who have contributed their knowledge, offering surprising insights that come from their local context. The curator of Jakarta Biennale and author Grace Sambo, who I previously collaborated with on my first book project, offered some key research contributions. She brought to my attention that one of the modern descendants of colonial exhibition is the Indonesian theme park Taman Mini Inda Indonesia, or beautiful Indonesia miniature park. With its various attractions and exhibits, it was constructed in response to tourism and according to national politics, including in some cases, inventing certain cultural traditions. General Soharto was officially elected as Indonesia's president in 71 and ruled as a dictator until 1998. In 1974, the former first lady, Siti Hartina Soharto, also known as Butkin, launched her Taman Angrek Indonesia Permai, or Orchid Park Gorgeous Indonesia, located on the border of central and western Jakarta. The park has held annual exposition, orchid exposition since its inception. Butian's orchid garden was relocated to Taman Mini in 1993, where um, in a land of uh, over 170 hectares, um, and uh, the park was launched in 1975. Four years in the making, the supposedly edutainment park contains over 26 traditional houses from all of Indonesia's provinces, museums, theaters, and even an IMAX cinema. Over 300 families were evicted for the project and received lowly compensation, while students leading protest demonstrations against this project were captured, and also many state businesses were extorted in making it happen, involving new kinds of expression to address the realities of an emergent nation, and also as statements of the officialdom that binds them, as Benedict Anderson observed, the site became the ultimate symbol of the president family's dedication to the nation. It expressed the unity and diversity of the archipelago. International leaders visited Indonesia and were celebrated here from presidents, prime ministers, queens, sultans, kings, to even the 1992 non-aligned summit attendees. In 1993, Soharto announced the orchid as one of the three national flowers of the country. As instructed in the presidential degree, they are white jasmine, moon orchid, and the giant padma. One of also Grace's suggestion was a collaboration with the Indonesian Society of Botanical Artists, which was created by Unike Nugroho and Jenny Kartavnata in 2017, with a big presence of largest left thought local artists and students. According to its founders, while botanical illustration is still important to describe new species, it can also be useful to promote uh, native plants to a larger audience in a more emotional way. And the aim of the society is that through this botanical art, artists can raise awareness and support the existence of plants, especially those that are threatened and also their conservation. Another scholar that I connected to and who has contributed to this research, curator and historian, Dr. Sadia Bunstra, recently curated on the nature of botanical gardens at Framer Framed, um, which featured contemporary Indonesian artists who look critically at botanical gardens, colonial power, economics of nature and knowledge production. By studying this exhibition and communicating with Sadia, other facets of the legacies and current consequences of uh, approaching nature and plants were revealed from this perspective. For example, the artist Zico Albaquini problematized the Dutch colonial gaze in imagery from beautiful Indies paintings by adding narratives from different cultures and history. His painting, Purifying My Homeland, depicts 
um, the pavilion inside the Buitenzorg Botanical Garden, which is now called Bogor, the same place where Emily Sal worked, where he attended a traditional Sudanese cleansing ritual, according to the artist, quote, to cleanse the world from bad omens, reconnect, reconnect with nature, the spirits of ancestors, end quote. The artist decided to focus on this site as it is a witness to history and uh, it is an important site for the collective memory that encompasses different cultures, Sudanese, colonial, and also the Indonesian nation. The artist composed the scene for a photograph he took himself and a similar other photographs and paintings from the collection of the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam. By adding these references to the stone statue of the Hindi deity Nandi and also flat baskets of rice, which are commonly used in the ritual, the artist uh, sought to shift the viewer's perspective towards other cultural tradition. An important facet of the research has also been the present dynamic between the destruction and protection of lands that echoes the colonial logic of previous centuries in a, the new guise of corporate businesses in Indonesia. In the documentary film, Our Mother's Land, journalist Febriana Hirdaus reveals that present day followers of the 20th century ecological anti-colonial movement believe that land, water and forests are common property to be used for the common good. In her introductory monologue to this documentary, Firdaus also describes how patriarchal society has limited women's actions. However, her film spotlights women who are able to break these boundaries so that they could build their own movements. Like their predecessors, these women reject the idea that the state can impose its own control over natural resources. Now, and they struggle against the expansion of heavy industri uh, extractive industries that threaten their land and water springs and where still connections to Dutch enterprises remain. The stories of these women show how these movements are a manifestation of eco-feminism and that nature cannot be separated from the role of women. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Karina, for that amazing presentation. Um, I already see so many points of interest with Sorowitz um, practice. And I'm really excited to, for us to kind of talk more about that later. Um, our final speaker for today's panel is Ruth Simbao. Ruth is the National Research Foundation Chair in Geopolitics and the Arts of Africa and a professor in the Fine Art Department at Rhodes University, Makanda, South Africa. She runs the Arts of Africa and Global South research program, which includes publishing and research of the South, Positioning Africa, and the Art POWA Network. As a team, her research group regularly runs Arts Lounge Africa at the National Arts Festival in South Africa. Simbao received her PhD from Harvard University and was an ACLS postdoctoral fellow with the Humanities in Africa program. In 2009, she received the Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award at Rhodes University. And her research interests um, of late include contemporary art with a particular focus on Africa, Africa, China, and the arts, strategic southernness, contraflow diasporas, cosmolocalism, the power of small spaces, site situational art, a geopolitics of knowledge, and forms of resistance and artivism. She's currently writing a book manuscript titled Africa, China, and the Art of Pushing Back. Recent curated exhibitions include Tanya Peterson, Between Land and a Raised Foot, 2019, Bright Aqua, 2018, Converge, Consuming Us, Slip, Blind Spot, and Making Way Contemporary Art from South Africa and China. Simbao is a core researcher in the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence, which is a Rhodes collaboration with the University of Lagos, Nigeria, Moi University, Kenya, Joseph Ki Zerbo University, Burkina Faso, and Bayreuth University in Germany. She is the PI for the research group, Artivism, Social Justice and Epistemic Revolution. Welcome, Ruth. Hello, everyone. 
um, warm greetings from South Africa. Um, thank you to Wong Bing Hao for the introduction and thank you to all the organizers. A special thank you to Nancy Dantas, who's a former student of mine who recently received her PhD from Rhodes University. So Nancy, it's wonderful to be here on this project. So thank you for the invitation. And I would also like to thank the artist, Miriam Dahl, whose work I'll be speaking about today. Um, I met um, I met her for the first time in Paris in, I think, 2014. And since then, she has very generously shared her work with me and her ideas with me. And also more recently, her own research that she's doing on putting together, reconstructing the biography of her late father, Dao Tiem. So thank you so much. I'll share my screen with you. So as being said, um, I'm currently writing a book manuscript on African and Chinese encounters in the visual arts. And I'm focusing on different forms of resistance and ways of pushing back. So I developed an interest in the concept of pushing back because so much of the official political rhetoric and the embassy speak of Africa, China is about solidarity. And yet on the ground, so many people that I engage with in various African contexts are very resistant to the presence of China in Africa. While the split between solidarity and resistance seems to be divided along the lines of the official and the unofficial, or the elites and everyday people, I'm always fascinated by realities that contravene apparent norms, slip between the cracks and surprise me. Of course, numerous questions about solidarity and resistance could be asked, way more than I can discuss in this talk. What is solidarity? How might solidarity be entangled with resistance? What are the differences between political, institutional, personal solidarity? How is solidarity expressed? Who can express it? And are some solidarities inappropriate or even harmful? One of the ways I try to dig below the surface of what might appear to be solidarity or resistance is to study and develop biographies not official biographies that are used to reconstruct linear histories, but in the words of Siraj Rasul, acts of biography that are informed by the narrative worlds into which people are born and processes of biography that might blur the lines between biography and autobiography, as in the case with the artist Miriam Dow, seen here with her father. There is often a messiness to the stories that we hear and the stories that we tell. But individual ways of telling stories and reconstructing biographies and autobiographies are essential to expressions of both solidarity and resistance. Our starting point for this talk is these two images. They're not directly related to each other, but they both extend across the places and concepts of Africa and China, raising questions about expressions of solidarity. Further, they both use portraits that are ignited in public spaces, and as such, these portraits become efficacious ritual objects. The photograph on the left was taken in Gauteng, South Africa in 2014, and is about stories out there, stories from the perspectives of journalists, cartoonists, and political comrades, big stories of solidarity and of showmanship. The image on the right is an installation by the artist Miriam Dow that was displayed in Paris, France in 2013. It is about stories in here, stories that are personal, intimate, and emotional at times. Miriam's artworks bring together her own autobiography with the biography that she's constructing of her late father, Dao Tiem. While some of her works explore issues of intellectual and activist solidarity as acts of autobiography and biography, her works are simultaneously resistant in and of themselves resistant to the known, rehearsed, and assumed stories about Africa and China. I begin in South Africa. In this photograph, we see a large painted portrait of Julius Malema, the founder and commander-in-chief of the South African political party, the Economic Freedom Fighters, EFF. Dressed in a red beret and red jacket, Malema reflects the revolutionary aesthetic of the EFF, a radical and militant economic emancipation movement, which some describe as quasi-revolutionary, quasi-socialist, or even fascist. 
The red beret that the EFF claims as its symbolic mark of resistance recalls the African leader and socialist revolutionary Thomas Sankara, who has been positioned, perhaps inappropriately, by the EFF as the party's muse. Although an EFF comrade declared that Burkina Faso has Sankara, Zimbabwe has Mugabe, Cuba has Castro, China has Mao, and South Africa has Julius Malema, EFF expressions of solidarity with Sankara are viewed with some suspicion due to assertions of party hypocrisy and corruption. When Malema's portrait appeared at a political rally, the media pointed out a likeness to Mao, and a Malan Garden story declared that Malema had turned into Mao Lema. The way in which Malema's portrait was paraded by EFF party members evokes the way that the well-known portrait of Mao is being carried in this 1971 poster seen on the left. Pro-Mao comrades marched to Beijing with the portrait on the right, as if they were carrying a religious icon in a procession. In both of these images, revolutionary comrades performatively activate um, portraits of their respective leaders, feeding a cult of the personality. In the original oil painting of Mao, the artist portrayed a full sky of swirling luminous clouds as an expression, he says, of winds of revolution. A comparable sky can be seen in this visual satire, Supreme Leader Mao Lema, created by the anonymous X Collective in 2014. In this work, Mao Lema poses in front of a fanciful unicorn that has been added to the original 1969 image of Chairman Mao that X Collective drew from. A few years later, the South African cartoonist known as Miles portrayed the EFF comrade in chief as Mao Lema once again. He stands in front of sun rays that are associated with images of Mao and as the great red sun and that reappear in a range of revolutionary images, referencing, for example, the Angolan War of Liberation and the Black Panther Party. In the Miles cartoon, Mao Lema holds up a little book titled Con and Troll the Media, referencing the book of quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong that is known in the West as Mao's Little Red Book. The title of the cartoon, Mao Lema's Little Facebook, refers to the concern of the South African National Editors Forum about EFF online harassment of journalists. In South Africa, somewhat shallow debates about revolutionary solidarity take place from time to time as politicians jostle for a claim. A few months after the appearance of the Malema portrait at Timbisa, the African National Congress announced that the name Mao Tse Tung was added to the geographical name bank of legendary persons and prominence revolutionaries. As such, colonial street names such as Vermeulen and Paul Kruger could be changed to Mao Zedong. The inclusion of Mao's name ignited impassioned deliberation, with some politicians upholding Mao as an important revolutionary and others referring to him as the butcher of Beijing. What is evident in these debates that often amount to little more than political showmanship is that understanding of historical solidarity between South Africa and China is somewhat thin. Further, meaningful knowledge about different waves of Chinese migration to South Africa is virtually non-existent, and I've written about that elsewhere. And contemporary ideas about solidarity are often driven by the back scratching of political elites. This does not mean, however, that more serious historical solidarity didn't exist in South Africa. While the Sino-Soviet split resulted in different views of China by various anti-colonial groups in South Africa, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the PAC, explicitly drew from Chairman Mao's ideas about a people's war in the form of guerrilla warfare. The documents in this 1977 PAC booklet on the left reference Mao's teachings on revolutionizing the whole nation including men and women, young and old. The front cover demonstrates how the aesthetic of Chinese revolutionary posters influenced liberation struggle and anti-apartheid visual culture in South Africa. The historical solidarity of the 1955 Bandung Conference in Indonesia and the 1957 Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Conference in Egypt has recently received renewed interest. At a time of revived decoloniality, scholars now grapple with the ways in which historical anti-colonial stories of salvation and redemption relied on a certain idealization, 
at times leaving out complexities and erasures such as gender, clan, and caste inequalities. Vijay Prashad argues that there was a powerful audacity to the Bandung spirit. As the colonized world became a player in its own right, Bandung spirit was a refusal of both economic subordination and cultural suppression. At the Solidarity Conference in Cairo two years later, Rameshwari Nehru stressed that freedom is indivisible. We are not fully free, she declared, as long as any member of our family or Asian of Asian and African nations is subjugated to slavery. Therefore, it is our duty to continue the struggle. 56 years later, the Paris-based artist Miriam Dow created a series of installations titled Bandung Spirit for the 2013 exhibition Chine Afrique, incorporating the portraits of Franz Fernand and Aimé Césaire. These portraits were displayed in ancestral altars as tutelary figures facing the streets in Belleville, a district that is home to many immigrants, particularly from Africa and Asia. This installation grows out of Miriam Dow's piecing together of her father's biography, as well as her own autobiography that is inevitably that inevitably materializes in the process. And it reflects her feelings of alienation and her disillusionment about France's hypocrisy and lack of freedom. Despite Paris being a haven of anti-colonialism in the mid 20th century, and despite France projecting a contemporary image of a sophisticated democracy, Miriam Dow experiences French society is deeply segregated in terms of race, class, and political citizenship. When she taught in school for five years, she moved on a daily basis from a school in a poor area to a school in an affluent area. The schools were almost completely segregated, the former consisting of mostly black learners and the latter being exclusively white. Trying to make sense of the segregated world and the disrespect leveled at her by the white pupils, Dao grappled with her own place as a woman of Asian descent, who is the daughter of an anti-colonial revolutionary father from Indochina. Turning to writers who were part of her father's intellectual family in order to make sense of her situation, she read Black Skin, White Masks and had, as she says, a real encounter with Frantz Fanon. It was Fanon's words that drew the link for Dao between her experience as a teacher in segregated classrooms and her father's experiences in the French colony of Indochina. In the conclusion to this book, Fanon wrote, and I quote, it was not because the Indochinese discovered a culture of their own that they revolted. Quite simply, it was because it became impossible for them to breathe in more than one sense of the word. Miriam's father, Dao Tiem, seen on the far left, was born in northern Indochina, which was, in, which was historically under Chinese influence and then colonized by France in 1887. Although he associated deeply with Chinese Taoist culture and was by profession a Taoist diviner, he could not speak a Chinese language. Growing up in Indochina, he could speak Vietnamese and French, but was forbidden to converse in Vietnamese in his parents' home. Dao Tiem joined a resistance movement that was marooning in the jungle, and he had to move to France in his early 30s to escape death. In Paris, he quickly became part of the political effervescence of the 1950s and, was a, and as various liberation movements influenced each other, the ideas of Pan-Africanism and the Negritude movement resonated deeply with his own anti-colonial struggle and intellectual ideas about Pan-Asianism. As Marin explains, Dao Tiem presented his political and activist ideas about anti-colonialism and pan-Asianism in lectures and in texts published in the magazine Le Musée Vivant. Other contributions were trade unionists, artists, writers and researchers, including the likes of Richard Wright, Michel Leris and Marcel Griot. The Parisian actor and poet Jean-Baptiste Tiemele of Cote d'Ivoire, seen here with Miriam at the 2015 Anti-Colonial and Anti-Racist Week in Paris, participated with Dao Tiem in the activist and intellectual salon run by the editor-in-chief of Le Musée Vivant, Madeleine Rousseau. This famous mid-20th century society of activists, intellectuals, and artists connected Dao Tiem with thinkers such as Sheikh Antediop and the writings of Césaire and Fanon. 
It was Rousseau, says Miriam, who forged the term la Frégie or aphrasia. In an article she published in her magazine in 1954, a year before Bandung. Dao Tiem found his own, founded his own activist cultural society, drawing together artists and intellectuals who were in exile in Paris. These intellectual and activist peers were Dao Tiem's political family, and it is this intellectual and political solidarity that inspired Miriam's installation of altars. Talking about her Bandung spirit altars, Miriam recalls that as a young girl, she would she would see her father perform an annual ritual at the family altar to commemorate his deceased parents. He would place incense, candles, rice and other food on the altar to honor his ancestors. When Dao Tiem died in 2002, Miriam was building an altar in her own home with a portrait of her mother who had already passed away. While her French friends questioned whether this created an unhealthy cult of the personality, for Miriam, it was about a deep spiritual connection that maintains a relationship with another soul, whether through a photograph or some kind of object. When her father passed away, Miriam looked after his bonsai trees, and she felt incredibly sad when the last tree died many years later. It was like his soul was in the trees, she lamented. The scholar Doris C. Y. Ching uses the term non-figurative metaphorical portraits to talk about objects such as bamboo, rocks or trees that serve as substitutes or portraits in disguise. Miriam Dao's altars were installed inside the windows of an organization that teaches French and Chinese languages to immigrant communities. One of the altars is an intellectual and political tribute to Fanon and is titled Gurrier Silex Fanon, named after one of Césaire's poems. For Miriam, when one selects a, photo a photograph for an altar, it is important to select an image that portrays the dignity of the person. Viewing Fanon as a composed, dignified and determined fighter, and considering how her encounter with his texts impacted her questioning of her own foiled Chinese heritage, she felt it was appropriate to connect his face to the body of one of the Chinese terracotta warriors that were buried in the mausoleum of the Emperor Qin Shi Huan at Xi'an. On the other altar, Miriam pays intellectual tribute to M.A. Césaire and her father's lineage by placing a portrait of Césaire and her paternal great-grandfather amidst the rice, oranges, candles and incense. Both Miriam and her father have complicated connections to their ancestors, and I refer to this as a kind of stickiness of being, something that is viscous, facing a certain measure of resistance. When Dao Tiem grew up in Indochina, he and all other children were taught by the French colonialists that their ancestors were the Gauls, the ancestors of the French white people. Over the years, he had created self-portraits in photo booths, and when he passed away, Miriam collected these photographs and made the work Our Ancestors, the Gauls. In the first four portraits, we see how Dao Tiem complied with the Republican French injunction of assimilation. In later images, he frees himself from the imposed culture, and by the fifth image, he takes off his tie and wears a Zhongshan suit, which was named after Sun Yat-sen, although known in the West as a Mao suit. The Zhongshan suit, the Nehru suit, and the, the Abacos suit pr promoted by Mobutu Seso Seko all became anti-Western and anti-colonial symbols. According to Miriam, the shift registered in these photographic portraits moved her, as her father was aware that this gesture was a political reclamation of his identity. In conversation with Miriam, she also shared with me some intimate details about her own experience of searching for connections to her ancestry. It was only in her 20s that she took Mandarin lessons and became interest, interested in the Taoist divination that her father wanted to pass on to her. When Miriam visited Vietnam, formerly part of the French Indochina where her father was born, she felt little connection. But the first time she went to China, she stood at the airport crying. It was my first contact with my ancestors' land, she says. Trained as an architect, Miriam Dao traveled to China on a number of research trips. On one of these visits, she was in China from December 93 to January 94 and was accompanied by a team of Chinese social science scholars. 
The 26th of December 1993 was the centenary of Mao Zedong's birth, and so portraits and effigies of Mao were everywhere. It was impossible to escape this media hype, she explained, whether in cities or small villages. Eventually, Miriam bought a small effigy to take back to France, and she created the photographic work Mao in Dao by taking self-portraits in a photo booth like her father. When she'd been in China, she felt so alienated amidst the Mao anniversary celebrations. She also felt nervous and oppressed when fellow Chinese researchers took away her passport and kept it in their offices when she traveled. In an attempt to exorcise these feelings of alienation and anxiety that she experienced in China, she played with Mao's portrait and reenacted his young appearance of the 1936 photograph by Edgar Snow. The Zhongshan suit that she wore was a woolen jacket that she bought to keep warm when she was doing research in the Guanxi Mountains. This interlacing autobiography and biography of Miriam Dao and her father, Dao Tim, Tim, is important in the way it grapples with and complicates questions of solidarity. Not only intellectual and political solidarity with Asia and Africa during Dao Tiam's activist experiences in Indochina and Paris, but also the complicated personal solidarities that Dao Tiam and Miriam face in relation to their own ancestry that was thwarted by colonialism and neocolonialism. These acts and processes of creating biography are messy not in a negative sense, but in the meaningful way that they reflect the complexities of solidarity and like-mindedness, the ideals and the disenchantments. Solidarity in this sense is not about sealed off unity or unanimous agreement. It is about linking ideas, minds, passions and behaviors in a way that leaves room for multiple resistances, tensions and contradictions to breathe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth, um, and thank you so much to Sorowit and um, Karina for your amazing presentations. Um, I'm sure you know everyone has a lot to think about and like process. Um, and thank you everyone who stayed on with us. Um, I'm really looking forward now to a kind of collective discussion with um, Sorowit, Karina, and Ruth and also to feel the questions that we've been getting um, throughout the seminar. Um, but I just thought like maybe some, you know, kind of brief points that I noticed from all of you that were really great, which is like, you know, Sora, what you talk about like a third place in your practice as a kind of mediator, um, something that isn't kind of tied to um, a, a sighted space or a body. And I really liked, you know, thinking about that in relation to Karina's research that is so kind of rigorous um, in the Baltics and Southeast Asia um, with Grace and Sadia and, and thinking about like this figure who, you know, you, you say that you basically have to like read between the historical lines, you know, between these like categorical criteria of like inclusion, exclusion, you know, there, there's like a lot more complexities. Um, and also, you know, then thinking about Ruth's presentation on Miriam Dow's work um, as, you know, what you call it, like resistant to known stories of Africa and China. You know, I mean, Miriam, uh, Miriam's family is really thinking, you know, from uh, North Vietnam and like that, that kind of history um, with China that is, you know, centuries long. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of point that out as like kind of good hopefully a good precursor to our questions because I think there were so many kind of um, um, overlaps, you know, between the work, there were so many currents. Um, and I just wanna thank you all again for, for um, such a rigorous presentation. Um, we have actually some really fantastic questions and um, maybe we can go to the first one, which I'm seeing here, which says, um, uh, to sorrow it, it's I think quite a, um, a question about the kites. Um, and it says, uh, hi sorrow it, um, as I understand from your presentation, the kite would be considered a contested body and sight 
where there is both liberation, you know, wind flying in the sky and constraint. Um, what you talked about with like gender bias and kite making. Um, and I wonder if you consider this uh, kind of double-edged nature of the kite as representative of like a queer and diasporic experience, which you kind of talked a little bit about. Um, and I wonder if you want to elaborate on that, you know, in relation to your work. Mm -hmm. um, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Um, yes. Right, the kite as a contested site and queer and diasporic. Um, I mean, yes, in a way, because, you know, as we know, gender is um, you can't separate it from the body. Um, or I mean, sorry, I'm trying to articulate at the 2 a.m. time. <laughs> um, I think maybe what, what's really helpful fun. is also to, yeah, maybe to think about that um, in relation to the work itself. Like, how do you see um, experience as like a queer diasporic person in that work um, in Jupiter? Um, maybe that can kind of give us an access point into the work. Right. Um, I guess I approached the, the kind of object as, yeah, as I mentioned in the presentation, as this mediator role and which often navigates um you know between this quite binary um dominions like i i gave example of um the oral tradition maori oral tradition of the sky and the land um but also i guess um what i brought up a little bit uh, later about um the weightlessness of air and if I try to think back to the first works that I show, which I presented, uh, which I carved the stone. So there's this dichotomy of weight, um, weights and weightlessness, which I guess I think about the kite a little bit in terms of um, what like our bodies um, act, as, act as an anchor. Um, and, and, and I guess, within the context of that work, I see the body as, you know, the rigidity of the body, um, yes, presenting certain limitations in the, in the um, of, of, yes, queer and diasporic um, experience. Um, not sure if that clearly articulate and answering the question. But. No, that, that's really great to hear. Um, I didn't even think about that, that kind of connection with the mass of the works. Um, we have a question uh, for Karina as well, which I guess I think also in a way relates to Ruth's presentation. Um, it's, uh, it says, so we may think about the overlooked histories of exchange as emancipatory for new research pathways that bypass the kind of usual centers of power. But how do we work with them if those histories include as well traces of um, asymmetric power relationships or even violence? Um, so I think this is from Inga. So I think maybe Karina and Ruth, actually this really pertains to both of your presentations in a way. And I wonder, Karina, do you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that I'm, you know, wrestling with all the time with this project. And, you know, like in the beginning, it started as this like, you know, wonderful discovery of this artist that had been, you know, erased from the archives here in Estonia. Um, but then as you kind of pull the thread more and more, you unravel this kind of, you know, um, just like the context and you know the white violence of colonial society in which you live and you know you can't separate one from the other and like both coexist and then you you know you also add this layer that um you know at least we know that from from andre Salz's perspective he saw himself as this 
objective viewer was what was happening in Indonesia. And he actually kind of, you know, saw connections between, you know, Estonians trying to become uh, emancipated from the Russian empire with, you know, Indonesia's trying to become emancipated from the, uh, from the Dutch. So like, so there's all this kind of, I think there's just like a complexity that you have to kind of keep inside the project that it's kind of not, uh, not resolved. And uh, for me, it's like when I, I realized that I really need to hear, you know, the other side of, of the story from the perspective of people who are, you know, living in these colonized lands, you know, in Indonesia and who are, you know, actively engaging with these histories, who are making work, you know, um, right now. And um, yeah, I think that's this kind of connection that happened because of this, um, like really um, adds, adds to the project. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's really, it's really like a, it's like a, it's a great question. And I think like the answer is not to reduce this kind of um, complexity while, you know, like we can look at Emily's work from this eco-feminist perspective even and celebrate her, but at the same time, you have to kind of uh, see the other side of, uh, side of it and the, the, yeah, you know, the asymmetrical power relations that she was in a position of power, you know, from a person who had been, um, you know, colonized um, in, um, in Estonia. Ruth, do you want to respond to that question? Um, maybe I'll connect it to, to another question where somebody asked me to elaborate on the notion of the stickiness of being. Um, so, you know, if I'm talking about um, sort of messy constructions and reconstructions of biographies and autobiographies, um, I like the way the scholar um, Siraj Rasul talks about how people are born into particular stories and then of course there's multiple ways that we see stories other people see our stories how our own stories change over time um, and I think in in the work that I'm talking about with Africa Asia talking about the asymmetric power relations is incredibly complex because it's not always the same thing I mean it, it, you know to even talk about China and Africa, I mean, Africa is made up of so many different countries and there's so many different sort of concepts and iterations of China itself. Um, so I think, you know, to really address that in, in the area that I'm looking at, one would have to um, kind of sort of look at smaller stories in specific places and specific situations and contexts. And, um, you know, what's incredibly complex in the the bigger area of China Africa um, is also issues of how different people in multiple places within Africa and China um, see and experience ideas about race um, because it's not the same well I mean this how it has changed over time and in history in China which is something um, <laughs> I can't say I've even begun to come to terms with it or, or really understand it's so complex um, so just thinking that back to to a stickiness of being um, I mean I think certain stories that people um, find themselves in and, and live out and experience might be stickier than others and I'm thinking of this notion of kind of a stickiness some a, a, a being that's viscous that something that um, in certain context and in certain ways doesn't necessarily flow that easily or faces some kind of resistance. I mean, I think obviously all of us experience that to a certain degree in certain ways, but, um, you know, communities um, or people who find themselves in exile context that, you know, for example, that I'm talking about um, when the asymmetric power relations um, are quite significant, um, then, then there's that sort of constant perpetual resistance in multiple facets all around one in terms of how one just engages with everything with, with the world um, and, and with oneself as well which I think comes out in Miriam's work in her own way of narrating her own story and looking at her own autobiography. I hope that answers something. No that's great that's great. I think of the stickiness um, I think in one of my earlier 
I forget who it was, but I think it was an anthropology of art scholar who was talking about stickiness, but I'm not sure. Um, if it comes to me, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, we have actually three great questions from Shairat, who is a young scholar. Um, and um, so I think maybe I'll go down the line. So um, Sorowit, um, uh, to Sorowit's beautiful presentation, I wonder, if um, they could say a bit more about the juxtaposition of different materials in their work, for example, beeswax and limestone, um, does it create a particular tactile or olfactory effect, which um, I think in this case, uh, Shairat is talking about seaside town. And I know Sorowit and I, we talked a lot about this because I was also really curious about like, because um, you can only see the images on the one hand, but you don't actually know like how the materials look and, you know, to your senses. So I wonder if you could like tell us a bit more about the materials that you use for Seaside Town and, um, you know, are there any specific tactile, sensorial or um, olfactory effects? Um, olfactory means sense of smell, right? Yes. <laughs> um... Yeah, it does smell like honey when you go really close to it. Um, but the scent, but but that's honey smell kind of fade away um, later on. Um, and I kind of drawn to the beeswax because I guess I mentioned um, how the limestone itself is a sedimentary rock, um, and basically a composite of um, marine skeletals um, fragments. And that made me kind of think of it as um, a body of bones. And I remember, you know, when I was younger, there was like this Thai, um, this is, there, there's a festival in Thailand called Loi Gratong where you like liked these um, little um, lamps made out of uh, terracotta cups. Um, and I remember dipping my fingers into like the, the beeswax at the state when it's hot and still kind of liquidy and just watching it kind of transform on my fingers because the temperature of my body harden it um, and just you know touching it and feeling this kind of fleshiness of the material and I think of this combination between the hardness of bones, um, which I kind of observed from the limestone. And I would, I kind of want to add warmth or something, a material that's kind of feel quite fleshy and elastic. Um, but also these two materials, you know, the process of how they become what they are um, also, you know, contain a different scales of time um, of becoming two. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's could, kind could of you, Could you then maybe list the materials? Because I know there's so many materials and people may not have caught it, but could you just right. list the materials? And then maybe like, because you mentioned honey and I know there's vanilla in there. So maybe, maybe you can talk about that. So there's some um, materials that I found along the beach. It's not too far from where I live. Um, there's pebbles um, from the beach, um, shells. There's some specific shells. Um, there's power shells. That's quite culturally quite significant. So I did ask again, ask for permission and consult um, um, an EB um, representative whether it's is it appropriate or not culturally. Um, what else is in there? There's vanilla pods, um, there's red rice, um, there's fish bones, um, two kind of di two different species of fish. Um, some I found on the beach, some I bought from the local fish market. Um, and also harakiki flowers, um, dry har harakiki, harakiki flowers, it's just um, a native plants that kind of grow along the coastal area. Um, yeah, I guess the process of gathering these materials, I did my best to kind of try to trace back to 
where it came from, like with the harakiki, I kind of traced back to how the location that it was grown. Um, and it was grown along the stream um, in the South Island in Christchurch, um, where they were trying to, it was part of this um, cleaning process, like bringing back um, cleanliness and life back to the stream. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's all the materials I can remember off the top of my head right now. Yeah, no, that's really great, you know, because I think the, the works themselves are kind of like vessels, you know, they're containers for these like different experiences that you've had um, in a kind of like, a, you know, there's no real like kind of resolution. So I think the question was really interesting because it was thinking about like what sensorial experiences, you know, I think you also alluded to that, like, um, basically, you know, it's a kind of futile question, like productively, like how do we capture all these experiences into like this one work, like one vessel. Um, but Shirat had a really great question for Karina as well, which is, um, he says, I really enjoyed um, Karina's talk and I wonder if she could say more about an eco-feminist perspective to Emily Stahl's work. Um, while Sal took part in colonial projects, um, does her work in any way formally or thematically differ from male colonialist works? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, yeah, I, I think, you know, what makes Emily Sal so, you know, valuable is that, you know, she wasn't commissioned by any, you know, king or queen or, you know, collector to do this work. Like she did it because she, I think she genuinely had like an appreciation of, of, um, of these plants and, you know, she was trained as an artist um, in uh, Tartu and then in St. Petersburg. So of course, you know, this was a way for her to, to continue being an artist and, you know, having an occupation, which was, you know, during the colonial period, women were not allowed to have jobs, you know, like it was, they were supposed to take care of the household and like art was one of the things that they were, that was, you know, permissible for them to do. Um, so, so I think, you know, like, um, there was also a question about the, the readings, um, and, you know, on decolonial um, histories, um, that I've, uh, done for this project. So, you know, I've read, you know, for example, Daniela Bleichmann's Visible Empire and, you know, books on, you know, Sewing Empire by, um, uh, Londa, um, Scheibinger, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. And, uh, you know, in, in all of these cases, there are usually, you know, these artists who are usually men who travel alone uh, and they are being sent to these corners of the world in search for these specimens. So this is not Emily's, um, this is not Emily's case. And, uh, and also, yeah, I mean, I think stylistically, it does have this kind of general um, kind of um, botanical um, approach. Um, and this is also something that she, uh, you know, used to describe her work, uh, that it was about art and science at the same time, that, she, you know, like you look very closely at several specimens, and then you create a composite out of these, and this composite is, is what we see um, in, these, um, in these lithographs that were made after her works. Um, so, so it did, uh, it did do that, but um, again, like, you know, uh, she did not have, you know, um, this uh, kind of um, commission of uh, of uh, of the um, you know colonial force to to do this work it was kind of like something that she she wanted to do and uh, she, I, I also learned that you know she was a vegetarian and she knew like a lot about you know a <laughs> plant and other things th throughout her life so so I think it was something that uh, she genuinely felt uh, felt uh, close to um, but yeah, at the same time, it is kind of, of course, implicated and, you know, you, you cannot divorce her, her position in, in the white uh, colonial society from, you know, from the work, like it, they, they come together, um, I guess. So um, this is something that uh, I find very compelling about her, her story. And also, again, the fact that she was, you know, erased from the archives here and uh, they said, oh, this work is not very interesting, you know, like this women's art, like, why would we keep this here? Um, so it was almost, you know, by, ch you know, by chance that it was, um, or maybe not that it was so appreciated in the US that people wrote about it. So we know that, you know, these are not just some random works of this, uh, of this uh, uh, unknown author. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's so great. I mean, again, I think that's uh, another can of worms that like I, I think we can open is like the idea of like a categorical genre of art. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think also one thing that I, I didn't mention at the start was that Southeast Asia kind of figures vaguely in everyone's presentation, which is kind of great. And I don't use vaguely like pejoratively, but it's kind of great to see like, you know, the, that it recurs so much. Um, and we didn't plan this intentionally in that way. Um, so I, I really appreciated that as someone who works uh, with and around Southeast Asia. Um, maybe we can go to the last question from Shairat uh, to Ruth, which is, um, you know, Ruth's wonderful presentation seems to touch on the post-revolutionary ethos in Africa and Asia. And I wonder if we could think of Dao's work through notions such as left melancholia or nostalgia, and how might we imagine Afro-Asian solidarity through such terms? Um, so. Thank you, thank you for that question. Um, I think, um, you know, be, beyond just Dao's work in, in more of the research that I'm doing on this topic, I think the question of nostalgia is really, really important and um, um, cannot be avoided. Um, and of course, you know, you know, it's so interesting to think of what is happening now in sort of particular politics, in particular countries in Africa um, in the moment and how things, how perspectives in relation to China from an African perspective are so incredibly different from what they were um, a relatively short time ago. Um, and so the interesting thing about nostalgia is the, there is definitely this kind of looking back as a way of understanding the present and as a way of wanting to to create a future, you know, Svetlana Boyum's notion of the future of nostalgia. So. Um, yeah, I, I, and in terms of solidarity, I, I mean, so much of the contemporary usage of solidarity is so superficial. I'm not talking about Miriam's work, I'm talking about in the general sort of public discourse and populist discourse about um, Chinese presence in Africa. Um, and, you know, politicians and, and embassies use it all the time, and it just becomes this repetitive um, the, this, this repetitive rhetoric. So I think um, looking at nostalgia is critically important. And, and I think what interests me in Miriam's work is how to go back to, for example, Bangdung kind of moments at a time when scholars are rethinking how they might have thought about Bangdung in the past. So rethinking about how we might have romanticized it in terms of um, the solidarity and, and sort of anti-colonial changes and how now there's so many things that haven't changed and you know that that narrow quote about the struggle continues well i mean look where we are in 2021 so this interplay between the past and the present and the future and um, how we and particularly on the african continent um, and china which are places of the future or have been espoused at places of the future i think looking through the lens of of nostalgia is extremely relevant so thank you for that yeah, I also I also thought uh, as you were speaking about um, Joan Key's recent work, and she's someone who um, we've engaged, and like I personally really kind of always look to. And she she talks about um, the kind of connections between Afro Asia, and specifically what are the kind of multiple and overlapping relationships, especially between things like inanimate objects. So you know she she thinks about like that kind of corroboration that she calls it. Um, as opposed to like collaborators in arms, she thinks of like corroborators in arms. But that was something I thought of as well, like as a different kind of approach to like what Afro Asia could be because it is such a kind of popularized um, discourse. So it was great to hear, you know, your take on it. Um, we have, you know, on the note of solidarity, we have two questions that are really detailed and really rigorous and which are great. Um, so one is from Augustine Diaz, who um, would like to ask Ruth if she is considering the concept of solidarity in, a, in the way it was used by Brazilian critic Mario Pedrosa during the creation of the Museo de la Sol 
Solidaridad in Santiago de Chile in 1972, having in mind the knowledge of China and Africa by Pedrosa, I was wondering if you consider any resemblance in Pedrosa's use of the notion of solidarity and the concept of solidarity in Afro-Asia relationships or Asian-African relationships. As for the instance, the conference in El Cairo in 1957, is there any documented relationship between these two notions of solidarity? Um, and maybe then this is a good point to kind of tie into another question from um, another audience member who says, I wanted to think more about these terms of solidarity and resistance outside of their metaphorical or discursive meanings. So, you know, something we were just talking about. Um, the decolonial scholar Rolando Vasquez recently proposed the term coalition as more impactful a term than resistance in decolonial thinking. Um, and Vasquez uh, suggests that a coalition goes beyond resistance. It doesn't imply a reduction of difference or binary action, but instead it signals an alliance of combined action. In this panel, looking sideways, bypassing um, centers of power, acknowledging shared transnational stories, could coalition be a productive way to think through this stickiness and messiness of like the real world context? So those were two really loaded questions and like we can all sit with them. Um, I think maybe the first question is more like, uh, maybe Ruth, you would like to address that, but I think the second question we can really think through together. Um, so Ruth, do you want to? Thank you for both of those wonderful um, questions. I really appreciate that. Um, just the short answer to the first one with Pedrosa. Um, I, I haven't actually looked at um, drawing up a comparison, I'm not aware of um, a documented relationship, but I'm very interested in that. So if you or anyone else um, has pointers to, to looking at making such a comparison, I'd really appreciate. I think that that would be wonderful and I'd love to look at it. Um, if I may, um, being just touched very briefly on, on the notion of coalition, and then I'd, I'd love to hear what other people in the panel have to say about it as well. Um, again, um, thank you for that. Um, a wonderful way of looking at different, you know, different ways of how we articulate terms and think through ideas. I think what I like on the one hand about coalition is the, the notion of the sort of something that's temporary. And I think that links to um, the, the term that I use, um, strategic southerners, you know, because, you know, people talk about the south being problematic, but the notion of strategic southerners What's important to me in that term is the fact that it's strategic at a particular time, at a particular moment, for a particular purpose to do something. And that um, we don't want to be talking about, you know, the necessity of sort of coming together in activist ways in the South in X number of years time, because for it to be successful in terms of what we're doing with Southerners is that it needs to be temporary. So I like that notion of, um, you know, the temporiness of coalition. On the other hand, um, you know, in terms of it being less binary than resistance, I mean, it entirely depends on how one uses the term resistance. And, and yes, it might have been used in certain ways in the past. So if you look at South African art, resistance art, protest art in the 1980s, it was used in a very, um, what now people might say, simplified way, because it only meant a very narrow thing, which served a purpose again at a particular time. So I think, um, you know, what I'm interested in looking at solidarity and resistance is how the two are like enmeshed and entangled and how you, in a sense, can't actually separate them. So, so it's not a, it's not a binary. So it's how to, you know, look at the unusual forms of resistance. Like I think, was it, was it sorry what you talked about? People protesting by lying, lying on the land, lying down on the land. So this notion of stillness and Oh, sorry, Karina, this notion of stillness and silence and withdrawal and not doing anything as a form of resistance. So I think resistance absolutely doesn't have to be, um, be viewed in a binary term. But thank you to both of you. Those are, those are wonderful ideas. So I appreciate that. 
Yeah, if I can add, I, I also totally agree with what Ruth said, and I think both, you know, resistance um, coalition and also decolonial thinking are very important for the context here. I think especially um, decoloniality is something, a term that hasn't been so much explored and in, in the context in which I live and work. Um, and for me, like the first time I heard about decoloniality was, you know, studying in the United States. I, you know, never heard about it um, in Romania. And I think now there's a lot of exciting work that's beginning to create this transversal, um, you know, uh, projects that, you know, connect uh, Eastern Europe with, you know, these other um, uh, parts of the world. And I think we, we need to kind of fully kind of engage with it before we, we before we discard it. And I think, yeah, as Ruth said, it's important how you how you use the word and how you, you know, like what what you mean by it. And also the context is very important in which it is used. Um, so I, I suggest that all these terms are very productive uh, for me as a thinker and curator. Yeah, I think that's such a, um, it's a good like kind of introduction to like what we're thinking about today. That's something maybe that we didn't necessarily conceive of as we were you know, thinking about the panel, which is really great that we have these like kind of offshoot discussions. Um, actually now I think maybe just a quick time check. We actually have about five minutes left. So I just wanna get into, I know the time passes so quickly, um, but I wanna get into one technical question for Sorowit and then one, um, if we have the time, like another kind of, uh, question for Sorowit and Karina. Um, Sorowit from Emily, she asked, um, she says, thank you for your presentation. I'm very interested in the process that you went through to get permission from the local iwi to work um, with the limestone in Seaside Town. Could you talk more about that process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so it is quite a new process for me and um, it is, it was scary at first because, um, you know, you, I'm threading the line that is, you, you, you have to be very sensitive of where are you coming from. And so basically, um, luckily the curator for the show that I presented the, the limestone in, she also have contacts um, with the, the gallery um, that the work was going to be exhibited. So there's a uh, two sides, um, the two, two, two points of contact. So I also myself um, have had a conversation with um, one of the staff that work at the quarry, um, the, the limestone quarry. And she is from the South Island and uh, of um, Ngaitahu. Um, which is the um, iwi in that particular region. Um, and she also, basically, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a conversation. Um, there's nothing too complex. Um, it's, it's conversational and basically I ask um, very clear questions and she confirmed that in that area there was no settlement. Um, there was, however, settlements further up north um, near the river mouth. Um, and to go back to the gallery again, um, in some art institutions here in New Zealand, there's a role called um, Tohonga, where um, the, what roughly translated to priest, um, of Maori priests, who, or, who would have um, certain knowledge um, in some specific areas, but they also have the ability to um, bless the space or the artworks um so it's the i guess it's a two process of um yeah talking to the quarry people and also because because land the the material um whether it's be stone or mud or soil it the concept of land is very significant to um maori cosmology and philosophy so to shift it and to relocate it from its original place, that's in itself is quite, I, yeah, I just had to be very careful about that, especially I'm not Maori, but also again, the limestone quarry, uh, I mean, limestone is very common, like 
it's a quite a commercial um, quarry and the material itself is used nationwide and even internationally like they export it um, so there's that context already that the material is used commercially um, it wasn't like I asked to the stuff for this basically for the stone to be quarried from like a national reserve or a national park and which is completely different um, yeah yeah, thanks so much for clarifying that point. Um, I know that uh, we have to leave like uh, in like two minutes, but I wonder if Karina, maybe you want to kind of address the last question a bit quickly, um, which is that um, actually Sarawit Karina brought in these important histories and, um, you know, presentations of what Western colonial perspectives call nature that is something separate from culture, separate from the human. And I wonder, um, this, this audience member asks uh, if um, looking sideways as a methodology uh, could be a means to better understand these like interspecies relationships like between culture, between like human and other than human relationships. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, I mean, I, I don't think I mentioned it in my presentation, but of course, you know, the creation of what we call nature is something that is part of the the colonial project and of course like you know indigenous people living then had totally different relation of what what we call nature was and you know like uh, as i mentioned we in these uh, you know proto ecological uh, movements uh, that were you know about resistance were um, you know, like they were, they were seeing their the land as kind of taught not as a, a commodity to be exploited, to be uh, you know reshaped and packaged. You know, and uh, the botanical um, tradition uh, in which Emily worked, you know, was about kind of like you know uh, taking these plants out of their context and putting this white background and kind of erasing the context in which they were. They were coming from and so they, they could be easily consumed so I think this is yes it is extremely valuable and um, of course I'm I'm thinking about this more than human other than human um, perspectives um, in the project as well and um, also with um, with the artists that um, I'm working with you know we also want to bring uh, voices from these uh, orchids and these plants into the project but this is something that we're we're still you know figuring out um, and um, yeah, and also in my, my future work, I'm also uh, planning to engage more with, you know, plants as these active agents, you know, and not just like passive um, objects to be depicted in imagery and how they, they uh, were agents in this, uh, in these histories and uh, how both lenses of both um, past and present um, and both people working both, um, you know, in um, in Indonesia and also um, in Europe uh, were um, were um, were um, affecting uh, these uh, these histories. Um, so yeah, so this is something that I'm actively thinking about right now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's great. I mean. I am. Um, I think on that note, it's uh, 11 a.m. EST. So. I think I just want to say thank you so much to uh, Sorowit, Karina, and Ruth, because I understand, you know, especially for Sorowit, it's so late. So I really appreciate all of us being here. And I think it's such a great thing that we had, uh, you know, overflowing discourse and questions that we couldn't get to. And I really apologize for that. Um, but I want to just give a gentle reminder to um, please register for our next sessions, which are tomorrow, next Wednesday, and next Thursday. So it's three more panels. And the link for registration is in the chat. And thank you so much to Sarawit, Karina, and Ruth. And um, we will end today's uh, panel and see you all. Uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>